All right, welcome everyone. Today we're going to start chapter 14, starting to work with these functions of several variables. Okay, so before we've been doing the vector work, now we're going to get into kind of a more expressions where we have a function f of two variables, most likely x and y, or even three later x, y, and z. But a lot of the work that we'll see is kind of reminiscent. It falls back on the discussions we had with our functions of one variable. When we start talking about derivatives, integrals, and whatnot, we start to see actions very similar to what we had done there. Okay. All right. So let me start to share my screen, the doc cam, and we'll get going. All right. So looking at this discussion, functions of several variables, right? So exactly that we have these functions defined f of x, g of x, right? That's what we would do in a single function or a single variable. But now what we're gonna see is that our functions will depend on two or more, or more, there we go, independent variables. Right, and so in a lot of the work that we'll do, I'll talk about, right, like back in 28 in our first semester, our first course in calculus, we would deal with functions f of x, g of x, right? Or you were talking like velocity, v of t, the acceleration, a of t, whatever it might be, right? We have functions dependent too far, sorry dependent on just one variable, All right? Our single variable calculus discussion. But now in 20C, we're gonna start to see functions that depend on two variables, two inputs that we have to include in order to evaluate. Or later, we can even have x, y, and z. Right, so now here we're going to talk about these functions of several, right, dependent on several variables. And as we start to get into other coordinate systems, so far we've only been working with our typical Cartesian or rectangular coordinate system. Okay, we can also deal with other coordinate systems, right? We can have, let's say, here our function g of r theta z right this is what we're going to start to see in cylindrical coordinates okay these pieces of information you might see you might remember from your work with polar functions in 20b our second semester calculus course here at mpc right the radius that angle theta but now if we're talking about three dimensions then we're also going to have like a z component Right, or later we can even have spherical coordinates, okay? And we can have values such as like r, phi, and rho, something like that, maybe different ordering, but just to kind of get those components in mind for when we do introduce those, we can talk about spherical coordinates. But the end result, this overall discussion, is that we have these functions now that have different variables, multiple variables that it depends on. Before we can calculate, we need to know values for x and y, x, y, and z, okay? And so then in this discussion, right, what we'll find is that the domain of a function of several variables All 
right? Will be more of more like a region of points that can be used to evaluate the function. Right, and so given a glimpse into that idea, most commonly, right, it can change depending on our equation, our function, right? Most commonly though, we'll have a function f that depends on both x and y, right? Or here, z, is equal to f of x, y, right? So this function defines how we're going to get this surface, this figure, where all the heights z are given by this function we compute, right? So in this case, we kind of see that those heights z of the surface depend on the values of x and y used to compute, right? That function f of x, y. So whatever we're plugging in, that's where we're getting that z coordinate. And so in that discussion about our domain and whatnot, what my kind of quick view is, is that in that xy plane, we can take some region D, right? So there's our domain region. And as we start, we'll probably begin with working with rectangles as our domain, right? X can be between zero to four, Y can be between like negative one to five, something like that. And taking any ordered pair from that region in that xy plane. My discussion is we can take that x and y, we can send it through our function, right? We can compute the value of that function and it's gonna bring it up to our surface, right? So whatever that surface, whatever that function is doing, right? We might get some surface like so, right? There's my f of x, y. That point is gonna send the x and y values, do that calculation, and give me that z value, that height, to build this surface, okay? And depending on which value you are, right, we might go to different locations, even on that border, that boundary, we can see where those pieces are sent via that function, right? So this function is a rule that takes an x and y value from some domain, some region, to create those values. But depending on how that function is defined, we might have a function where X depends on Y and Z, or Y depends on X and Z. So we just kind of shift that view for where that domain will be, what value the function depend, what variables that function depends on to get that last variable. Getting into some of these functions that depend on three variables, right? taking a value for X, Y, and Z computing, graphically, visually that might go beyond what I can necessarily draw because then maybe that value, that result of an X, Y, Z calculation is going to a fourth dimension, which we can necessarily graph on our papers here, okay? All right, but that idea is that we're just taking this ordered pair, the set of values from a particular region plugging them into a function, a rule, and computing to get those components, okay? And again, taking some of the work that we would have done in 12.6, those graphs of our quadric surfaces, we can start to put it into this format, okay? All right, so in that discussion, right, in working, 
with these functions of multiple variables, of several variables. We can consider different segments or kind of like these levels for the graph of the surface. Okay, so again, thinking back to some of that work we would have seen in 12.6, right? So now if I have my function f of xy, where I'm again, kind of commonly attributing that result to be my z component, okay? We can start to look at different segments, different levels. And so here we can take these level curves, which are kind of like our traces that we had done back in 12.6 with our quadrant surfaces, right? What we're gonna do is we're gonna let Z be a constant, okay? Some value K. So then we're gonna have that f of x, y is equal to k, right? Where that be zero, one, two, whatever that value might be, right? And what we're gonna do, we can identify all points x, y that share a common, the same Z value, right? That are going to work on that are gonna stay on the same level, the same segment of our surface in that region, okay? And so for example, okay, boom, what if we have our, function f of x, y is equal to, I'll just do again, something simple enough to work on. Let's say we have here four minus x squared minus y squared, okay? Which is gonna be equivalent they're saying, okay, my z is equal to four minus x squared minus y squared. Okay. And so in that format, in that notation, looking at that function, looking at this from 12.6, thinking about what this figure may be, okay. Shifting back to that page, right? How we kind of organized in our notes what those surfaces might be based on those. One linear term, two quadratics with the same sign. So in this case, this is going to be a Paraboloid. Okay. And again, think about if I was let the y be zero, z equals four minus x squared. One linear, one quadratic, that's y equals x squared, that's that parabola, right? And we're getting both the x and the y, the z, x, z, y plane. So we're gonna get this paraboloid, right? But now when we start to consider these different level curves, Right, let's let z equal zero, for instance. Right, so in that xy plane, what does this equation become? Then 
it becomes zero equals four minus x squared minus y squared, bringing the x squared and y squared over to the other side, x squared plus y squared equals four, right? If you're looking at that, that's a circle. Center at the origin with a radius two. Right? And we can just work our way up. Right? What would happen when z equals one? One equals four minus x squared minus y squared, or x squared plus y squared. Subtracting the one over equals three. So again, another circle with the radius, the square root of three, right? Take the square root to get the radius. Continue on, we can do all these other values for z. We can let z be negative, negative one, negative two, negative three. In another interesting one, z equals four. Four equals four minus x squared minus y squared or x squared plus y squared equals zero. Right, the fours cancel. So thinking about, okay, what x, y coordinates, what x, y points satisfy this relationship. Again, thinking more squaring, everything turns positive. So the only way to add two numbers and get zero, right, two positive numbers and get zero, this is just a point. Zero, zero. And then we'll do one further is equals five. Now we're getting x squared plus y squared equals negative one. Two positive values added together to get a negative. That's impossible, right? It's undefined. It's going to be a case when there's no points that can satisfy that relationship, right? So then what we're kind of doing with these level curves then, these kind of traces, right? In the XY plane, okay? Right? In that plane, we're starting to see that, okay, along this band, let me put in blue, I guess, that circle with radius two, center at the origin. Right? This set of points is all going to correspond to when part of my k, my z is equal to zero. Then Another band we can do, right? All right, when z equals one, the radius is square root of three, one point seven three and some extra decimals. If I remember my, if I remember my uh, tree work, okay. But generically placing it like so, that set of points. That's going to be when z equals one, right? And we can continue. We can do another set, right, with some other values, right? When z equals three, for instance, that's going to correspond to a circle with radius one. When z equals four, it was just that singular point, right? So we get these kind of concentric circles. And this is like our domain space, right? To calculate in that function, we can take any x and y, there's no restrictions. I'm not taking the square root of something where I need to make sure that the value stays positive. It's not in a natural log where, again, I need to make sure I'm greater than zero in that expression. Thinking about some of those rules for the domains of functions we had before, limitations, restrictions we would have with this polynomial, we can calculate anywhere. But with that work, 
in the domain space, right? What we call this our domain space, right? Our domain region. Those XY values that we can take is kind of identifying, it's pushing down that surface and saying, okay, all the points from our domain along this band, along the space, are gonna have a height z equals zero. Along this piece, a height is equal to one. Next one in, right, is equal to three. And so when we start to translate that into our actual surface, right, with z equals zero, we're down here, right? We're looking at that circle, radius two, in the xy plane. Z equals one, right? So going up by one, now we're gonna get that portion. When Z was equal to three, right? Our smaller circle, radius one now. And then at four, just that point, right? And so then as we start to go through, and again, I know my connection's a little bit off here, but right in these different spaces, now we're getting this parabola opening downwards. So we're just looking at different slices, different levels along the way. I know this should actually kind of connect out, but bear with me on my graph, okay? So we're taking these kind of different segments, these different slices of our graph. And if you look in the book, of course, much nicer figures and graphs, okay? If you look at example 12, page 936, right? It's kind of inverted, but the same idea, right? In that X, Y plane are different slices of what that looks like. We push those levels down. And as we start to stretch it back up, we can see, okay, when z equals one, two, three, four, what that shape looks like. And so it's kind of like in our graph, I'm kind of looking at it upside down, right? Here would be my x, y plane. And then as I start to cycle my way up till we get to that point. Okay. But that gives us a way of now kind of considering these functions of several variables. Okay. And trying to break down the graph. We're not going to do a great deal of intricate graphing here. But it's starting to get that aspect of view as you work with these functions, okay? What types of x, y values can we use with points? And then building up those level curves, what do those x, y relationships look like, or from our domain space, what do those look like when I start to fix the result of my function, most likely z, but it could be x is going to be a set value, y set value, so on. And kind of building that framework, we can again think about building graphs, or looking for common characteristics of our points on these surfaces, okay? And so something that we'll kind of work with and utilize, right, our, in our work here, right, level curves are seen in a great deal, right, as a good example here of topography maps, okay? Thinking about when we're hiking and checking on elevations of hills, mountains, terrain, that will cross, okay? And again, the book has some good graphs here, okay? A lot more intricate. So again, on page 933, for instance, we kind of have this, and again, it's a little bit blurry, 
right? So for some function here, we can imagine mapping this mountaintop and all these little lines, those kind of little curves, as you can see with those numbers identifying, are those elevations. So as long as you're on this portion, this path, you're gonna have an elevation of 4,000 feet, 4,500 feet, right? And so as you start to move, if our trail or this kind of river passes through and you're going from one line to the next, right? We can see that kind of ascension then climbing up the hill, climbing that elevation or vice versa, dropping down the elevation, okay? And so thinking about that, when we look at these maps, okay? We can have these different kind of portions where maybe on some spots, our lines are very close together and other parts further apart. Okay, and all depending on, right, the terrain. And so what we're kind of looking at is that each kind of segment, each closed curve, that we see here represents a different elevation, right? Or altitude, how high we're up. And so then we can start to take those marks and start to see, okay, as I move along my trail, how rapidly I might need to climb up a hill, or if I can take my time to progress my way down or out of that valley, you can start to map out paths over which the surface and that mountain that lives on top of that may look like, okay? Or another kind of representation without topography is like weather systems, right? Those temperature bands. Okay, how severe storms are going to be near the eye of a hurricane as you work your way out. Okay, temperatures across the country, so on. These types of maps, those level curves, right, where we're fixing that value, we're fixing the temperature, fixing the elevation, starts to come. Okay, all right, so there's a good introduction to our functions and multiple variables. And definitely working with these, we're going to jump back a lot into that 28. Okay, how do we take the derivative of this? and applying that to our function of multiple variables in a very similar manner, okay? And that's where we're heading with this chapter. All right, so I'll stop sharing. If you have any questions, concerns, definitely let me know.